Welcome to the Mixology Talk Podcast. I'm Chris. And I'm Julia. And we're the folks behind abarabove.com, the ultimate resource for craft bartenders, bar operators, and just about anybody else looking to make great craft drinks. I'm a bar consultant with more than 10 years of industry experience. And I run abarabove.com, bringing weekly articles and cocktail recipes to help you make great drinks and grow your career behind the bar. This is episode number 99, and a couple weeks ago, we received an email from a listener in an interesting situation. He'd spent his entire career working in public schools, and he decided after his retirement that he was going to work as a bartender. Obviously, I'm very, very supportive of this career decision, and we're really excited for him, but he asked us specifically what we recommended he should work on learning before he starts his new career. He had a little bit of time, and he wanted to, I guess, study up, which makes sense. We actually get this question kind of a lot. A lot of folks getting started in the industry and want to know what they can do to be prepared. So that's what we're going to talk about this week. We're going to answer our listener question and uh, hopefully provide some useful advice along the way. So one of the first questions that our reader asked us, um, which actually makes a lot of sense because he has an academic background, was he asked if we would recommend that he actually go and enroll in a bartending school, which I think is a really, really good question. And um, for me, I definitely don't want to discourage anybody from going to bartending school because it is better than nothing. But there are a couple things to really be careful about and a couple things to look for when you're shopping around and considering going to a bar school. The first thing, and I think one of the most valuable things about a bar school, is look for one that gives you the physical element of learning the craft. And practice, and and repetitive practice. I know I went to an afternoon bar school. It was like three hours long. And in the course of that time, we got a, a history of the cocktail, and I got to pour one drink. That would not have been useful. (laughs) Yeah, and so much, um, and one of the things I really reinforce with this reader is so much of what we do is a physical skill and muscle memory that just repetitive motion over and over and over and over and over again is very, very valuable. And it's something that you just can't jump right into. So find a bar school that really helps you get that muscle memory in and go through the repetitive process of learning our skill set. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense to start to try to build that muscle memory. And do keep an eye out. There are, unfortunately, a lot of low-quality schools out there. Gosh, I've come across several that are like an online two-hour video course, and they say that at the end of that course, you're going to be a pro behind any bar. I hate to break it to you. That's not true. It's uh, completely unrealistic. Be discerning. Be picky. A lot of these programs are very expensive. I would say, like we mentioned, find one that gives you lots of physical practice. Find one that's run by a professional bartender. And I would also say, I know that you highly recommend looking for a bar school that has job placement. Yeah, I think that's one of the biggest values that a bar school can provide because it can answer a lot of demand in the market. If you know as an employer that you have this endless supply of new bartenders coming through the ranks through the school, it makes a really good partnership. But on the other end, as a new bartender, all you need is that first job to get your experience, to say that you've actually attended bar somewhere. So find a place, if you can, that offers that first job placement because that's where the real value of a a decent bar school is, in my opinion. Yeah, and one last thought to consider. When you graduate from bar school, don't, I guess I would just say, don't be cocky. And there's so much you can learn from just doing the hours and hours behind the bar. And and so, I, I mean, I think, yes, it can definitely help you learn the physical skills. And I do think that can be very, very helpful. But you may actually consider not putting it on your resume. In this industry, it's something I've never seen in any other industry, I have actually seen having a bartending school on your resume as, it's almost like a sign of inexperience. Yeah, it's a sign of like, I don't have enough of any experience to put on my resume. So my tendency is to tell people not to put it on there. Unless you have a really great school in your location, wherever you're at, and that has a great reputation in the community, I would probably avoid putting it on a bar on your resume. And it just goes back to why you would look for a school that has job placement. Because once you have that experience, you won't need to put it on the resume. Exactly. Yeah. And one last thing on bar schools um, before we go. I did actually attend a bar school after I became a bartender. And one of the things that I really kind of didn't care for was their actual recipes. Very outdated, very old school, weren't relevant at the time. And I don't know if any bar schools have really updated their curriculum 
but it's something else to keep in mind. And the fact that the recipes that you're learning will probably not be the same recipes that you actually ten bar with. Right. So I wouldn't go and you know spend two weeks memorizing their drinks binder. Not because they're necessarily outdated. They may be. They may not be. But the first job that you show up at, they're going to have their own. They're going to have their own recipes. They're going to have their own set of drinks, and they may have their own recipe for something standard, like a Manhattan, even. So take the the specific recipes, I guess, with a little bit of a grain of salt. Right. Definitely make sure you can pass the test and all that stuff. But don't be surprised when you get your first job if the recipes are very different from the ones you learned in bar school. Now, one of the other things I mentioned to the reader was the fact that um, you know there's a lot of great books out there to just go ahead and wrap your head around um, our industry and some really great recipes and just kind of get a better understanding of what you're about to sign up for. And typically the first book I recommend, especially if there's a focus on craft cocktails or getting into mixology, is Dale DeGroff's Craft of the Cocktail. That's a great place to start. Yeah, and there's so many good reasons why this is kind of the first recommendation that I give people. First of all, Dale DeGroff is single-handedly the person that everybody looks to as creating this craft cocktail movement and revitalizing it. Uh, His work at the Rainbow Room really shifted the way bartending was looked at and um, the recipes even now that we work with, incorporating fresh juices and syrups and getting away from sweet and sour and you know neon green products that go into the cocktails he was kind of the person that that brought this all back and the recipes are solid in this book you can't really go wrong with the recipes in this book so that's usually my first recommendation yeah i know that you've also often recommended joy of mixology another great book so the second book i usually recommend to people is the joy of mixology by gary regan he is one of those big figureheads in this industry as well This particular book does a lot to understand structure of cocktails. He's one of the first people that, in my opinion, really set up kind of cocktail families. Some of the the recipes in there are definitely dated, but he also has some nice story. He's a really good storyteller, so he's got some great stories about things to keep in mind as you kind of work yourself into this bartending role. Uh, He's got some really great stories and uh, it's worth a, definitely worth a read. And one of the last ones I usually recommend to people is Setting the Table by Danny Myers. And this is not a bartending book, but this is definitely more along the lines of a hospitality book. Anybody that's getting new, into hospitality that's never been in there before should really truly understand what you're getting into and the mindset that you should adopt. And this is an amazing book for that. And the last couple of books... A little bit more of advanced reading, but Morgenthaler's Bar Book, absolutely fantastic read. You know, once you've gotten through, made your way through these, I highly recommend that. And also kind of sprinkle in some of the old school classics like Jerry Thomas or Charles H. Baker, just to name a few. They're solid foundation books if you're getting into craft cocktails. Yeah, absolutely. And to sort of piggyback on that and to kind of go against what we just talked about, Another good thing that would probably be a good piece of preparation would be just familiarize yourself with some of the common recipes that you can expect to get ordered when you're on your first shift. I think while we did discuss the fact that every every bar is going to have its own sort of recipes, it's also probably a good thing to know that a margarita is made with tequila. Right. And there are just some standard cocktails that, that I think everyone should be acquainted with. So that way when somebody orders it, you don't like look at them like you're cross-eyed or they're speaking a foreign language. You know, these are some really great old school classics. And um, I would definitely recommend knowing these. Instead of spitting them all out here on a podcast, why don't we put a link to some of the cocktails in the sure, uh, show we'll, notes? we'll definitely put the link in the show notes. But, I mean, it's, it's definitely not going to be anything that will surprise you. And, you know, margarita, old-fashioned, Manhattan, that sort of thing. Right. I think just familiarize yourself with the common cocktails, and like I said, we'll put the list in the show notes, which will be at mixologytalk.com slash 99. Yeah, and uh, the last thing to kind of keep in mind as far as recipes go is there's many different types of bars out there. If you're going to be working in a tiki bar, they're going to have their own standard that you should really know that aren't going to be the margaritas and the old fashions. Right. If you're going to be working in a neighborhood bar, you're probably going to be making very few cocktails. You're going to be pouring a lot of beer. A lot of beer, a lot of shots, you know, maybe a couple of gin and tonics, and that's about it. But don't get too caught up on, like, just understanding a ton. More cocktail recipes is not always a good thing. 
understand the basics really well first, understand balance, drink a lot of these drinks yourself. Not all at once. Not all at once, and, uh, <laughs> you know, definitely uh, not all at the same time, but uh, you definitely want to get associated with or kind of develop your skills as far as balance and what it should right. taste like. And um, like I said, that Delta Graf book is a great place to start for understanding um, cocktail recipes and balance. Yeah, and I think be gentle with yourself as well. I think that nobody's going to expect you to show up at your very first bartending shift and be able to describe in great detail the difference in taste between a daiquiri and a margarita to your customer. I mean, be gentle with yourself, give yourself time to learn, but also hustle. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, and, and the speaking other, of hustle. Uh, speaking of hustle, <laughs> it's a very physically demanding job. I continuously tell people this, but you're running a marathon behind the bar. You really are. So developing your physical skills quickly is very, very, very vital. And um, if you're looking for your first job, this is a good place to start. If you're not peppering the, the city with resumes, you know, practice your physical skills. I think the first physical skill that every bartender should know is the art of free pouring. How to properly pour a one and a half ounce shot, a one ounce shot, three quarter ounce shot, like really vary it up by quarter ounces and be able to time them perfectly. And just get comfortable with the feeling of the bottles in your hands. I mean, you can really tell when somebody's never poured out of a pour spout before. Yeah, no, it's it's interesting. Like when I was interviewing bartenders, you can tell their experience level immediately by how they grip the bottle. It's a weird thing, but if they grip the bottle from the bottom, you know they haven't really poured a lot. High speed environment. The proper way you should pour is grab the bottle around the top of the neck and cradle your thumb over the pour spout. Not, and not put it over the air spout, but um, you definitely want to have control over that pour spout. And uh, yeah, if somebody does that immediately, I know they've been in a high volume place. Exactly. That, that sort of is a sign. And so what about shaking, though? That's, I mean, when I think of bartending, I think of shaking. Yeah, and this is one of those things that you just, you can tell somebody's experience level very quickly by the, not only the way they shake, but the biggest telltale sign is how they break the shaker open. Ah, um, so it, and it's really it can be very funny, but it could also be kind of tragic. Um, <laughs> and watching how somebody actually shakes a cocktail after a while, you know, there's a couple different ways. But people without a lot of experience, or people that don't have a lot of experience, tend to shake it really kind of more in front of their body, and they kind of cradle it like a baby. Or it's weird how they hold it. But <laughs> experienced bartenders will shake it fairly vigorously and. And hold it in their hand like a football. It's almost over their shoulder. Over their shoulder, yeah. or they'll definitely put a lot of force in it. So go to your bar, your local bar, watch how they shake cocktails, practice that in the mirror. And, um, and <laughs> sorry, you just said holding a cocktail shaker and shaking it like a baby? And no, <laughs> no, don't shake it like a baby. No. I'm, like, not, I'm not laughing at no. that. I'm sorry. Yeah. But I yeah. couldn't help but laugh. Um, <laughs> no, thank you for catching that. Definitely don't shake it like a baby. Um, but spend some time on YouTube. There are so many great videos that can help you, show you where do you hold, how do you hold, and just do that practice. Stand in front of a mirror, be that guy video yourself, just getting a little bit more comfortable. You know, the difference between your first shake and your 20th shake, it's going to be huge. Yeah. And um, there is one huge thing do not do. Whack don't it against the bar? Ever. Especially if you're working with glass, don't try and break the seal on the bar. That's an instant. People do that? Oh, that all the time. Thing? Even experienced bartenders that I've, I've oh. seen have done that before. And it can be extremely tricky to break that seal. But with enough experience, you know, you do it a couple of times, actually make a drink in there, put water, put ice, put alcohol, whatever you want in there. But real world experience of breaking that seal can be very, very difficult to do. And people have like bang it on the bar. Oh my gosh. It's, it's really bad. I mean, if it's glass, that just sounds dangerous. It's going to break eventually. So, oh, well, you broke the seal. Put the time in, learn how to do it right. Yeah, that's definitely worth it. I would also say to spend a little time learning to stir. It sounds a little counterintuitive. We all know how to stir our coffee, but there's a little bit of finesse to it. Yeah, and this is something that I see very experienced bartenders not doing at all. And it's kind of alarming shaking Manhattans and all that. And I get it. It depends on where you work. But it's pretty much standard. If it's spirit only, you stir it. But there's a good way to do it. There's a bad way to do it. A lot of new bartenders or people that don't know how to stir a cocktail will actually invert the spoon. So the spoon is facing up and the top of it's in the drink because you don't have as much resistance. 
Oh, interesting. Right. Is and that I, a sign of like naivety or is it a good thing to do if you're new? If you're new, it's not a bad thing, but I really do recommend putting the time into learning how to, how to stir a cocktail. You're going to get a lot less resistance because there's no bowl kind of dragging its way through the ice. That's so kind of the point of stirring there, right? Right. I mean, it's basically like stirring with a chopstick at that point. Got it. Uh, which you could totally do. You could do that. Um, but Start with your finger. You There's could, so many well, options. And actually, Gary Regan is uh, the guy that made the uh, Joy of uh, Mixology. He is famous for one cocktail, and that is the finger stirred Negroni. I did not know yeah, that. Yeah, so... Um, I hope he washes his hands. <laughs> there's a whole a whole story behind that but yeah take time learn to stir either with a mixing glass or a pint glass preferably both because you don't know what your bartender or your bar is going to be working with but take the time to learn to stir especially if you want to work in a really nice place fine dining restaurant a craft cocktail bar you're going to have to learn how to stir definitely and i think that i would say almost the punchline for this whole section is the more you practice the more great cocktails you get to taste. There is nothing wrong with practice. See if you can get your family on board, uh, not the children, but <laughs> get your husband or wife on board. See if they'll help you uh, with taste testing your cocktails. And go out and have a few drinks and watch what's happening behind the bar. T you know, Take note. I, mean, I think it's such a dance. I think when you, before I ever joined the hospitality industry, it was magic. I would sit at the bar, I would say what I wanted, and a beautiful drink would appear in front of me. And now... I've been completely ruined by Chris and I stare at what everything that's happening behind the bar. And it's an amazing dance of many, many different people taking care of many different pieces such that that drink magically appears in front of you. And I think go to the kind of bar where you want to work, sit down, order the kind of drink that you might order and see what happens. Pay attention. Yeah. And there's so much they could learn from just watching an experienced bartender from the little ways that they work behind the bar, watch their hands. There's something really interesting that happens when you get into kind of go mode as a bartender. For me anyway, I don't know about everybody, but I, I start to do more of a crab walk than I do a step forward or step back walk. Because everything, I have not seen the crab walk. It's, and it's not like an exaggerated crab walk. It is basically everything should be within a step. So you're doing a lot of one-step reaches. So you're not moving forward and backwards like you would in a normal work environment. You're making steps left or right. If I need to go behind me, sometimes I'll shift my entire body 90 degrees and then take a step to the right, which gets me Got it. directly behind where I was. It's a lot faster than taking three steps to where you have to go. Right, exactly. And not only that, but your peripheral vision is really important because if you step backwards and you don't know if somebody's behind you with a glass rack, you could have made a really bad mistake. And it's going to happen, but by turning your body, you always have the ability to kind of see almost all the way around you. And um, just by sitting at that bar, you're going to start to see this stuff. And, you know, starting to pay attention to all the processes that are going on in the background, the bar back and what he's doing and the cocktail waitresses and what they're doing and how everybody works together. I'm not saying that I uh, spend the rest of your life at the bar. Well, I suppose you, you probably will one way or another. <laughs> But it's definitely worth a few visits. Yeah, and you know, if you're going to places that you want to work one day or even start off in, you're going to get to know people. You're, they're going to know you. They're going to, um, you know, you get to get a relationship going, and you'll really know what you're getting in, yourself into. This could be a great way of getting your first bartending job. I remember one bar. I actually, after I got off work, they knew I was a bartender, and. One of their bartenders called in sick, so they said, hey, Chris, can you help me out? Oh, I remember that. Work behind the bar with me, and, I'm, and I asked them, sure, when? And they're like, actually, right now. So if they know you're, you're looking, if you know, one of the barbacks calls in sick or something like that, you never know what's going to happen. It's all about relationships. We it really say, is. We say it in every single episode, I think, but this industry is all about relationships. And if you have been at the bar a couple times, you've made a few friends. And then you show up for an interview, you've already got a family face. Yeah, absolutely. So I think the moral of the story is I don't want to, you know, we don't want to discourage you from anyone from going to bartending school, but really keep in mind that this is just not even laying the foundation. You're getting a sneak peek and that's it. It may give you a little bit of physical practice, but I would definitely suggest doing more of that, especially if you go to the kind of bar where you want to work, take a look around, see what tools they're using, and then go sit in front of a mirror and, and, and just practice. Yeah, and it's going to take you many 
years to develop a solid, solid skill set. Just like bar. any career, and there's nothing wrong with that. I am just so excited to hear somebody say they're taking on bartending as a second career. Yeah, that's pretty that's amazing. Fantastic. And to anybody else out there who's just getting started, I'm excited for you. I, I, I hope this episode hasn't been discouraging in the least. I really do feel that it's a great industry to be a part of. I think a little bit of preparation will definitely help. I think it's not the kind of industry where you can necessarily just sort of walk in and sit down and get a job anymore. I think it's a little more challenging, depending on your market. But with a little bit of preparation, with a little bit of practice, I think you'll be just fine. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you very much, everyone. And uh, we'll talk to you in episode 100. Holy cow, that's yeah. the next one. I wonder what we're going to talk about. I don't know. We have to figure that out. We'll have to see. <laughs> uh, we'll check out the show notes at mixologytalk.com slash 99. We'll include the links to all those books and that list of Chris's suggested recipes for you to take a look at. Cheers, everyone. Cheers. Never miss an episode by subscribing in iTunes or YouTube. And as always, check out the show notes by clicking on the right.